one more chapter to go. When I was writing the book, uh, I came to this idea and I thought, well, let's just have a little fun. So what I'm going to say to you, at least in part in the beginning, is, is more philosophical. It's anecdotal in one sense. I'm not trying to create a new theology uh, uh, because what I want to talk about is odor weaponry. You, you never hear about it anymore, but in the ancient times, it was, a, it was somewhat of a, of a big uh, deal. Uh, it's not a common topic that you encounter uh, these days, but the idea in ancient warfare of repelling an enemy by some kind of noxious odor was a big, uh, a big deal. So you overwhelm the enemy in order to get him to just throw down his arms and retreat. He doesn't want to be in the, uh, in the space uh, anymore. So here is the question, and it may seem silly to you in the beginning. There is a biblical connection, but I'm not trying to, again, set forth a new theology of, of, uh, of spiritual warfare or odor weaponry. I just want to draw the analogy to think about, uh, think about this for, for a moment. Does prayer, does prayer have the potential of so transforming an atmosphere that it in some way disables evil or sends the enemy in flight? Is it not maybe so much our words because we've, we've shouted at the darkness long enough Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something that's missing. Maybe it's the fragrance of our life or the fragrance of our heart um, uh, alters. The Bible clearly draws an analogy between prayer and odor or prayer and incense and, and, and prayer, therefore, as fragrance. Uh, and it suggests that God is attracted to such an aroma. Again, just thinking through this and considering uh, this. In fact, the Bible says that we are to be a fragrance that introduces or is connected to the knowledge of Christ. And in the tabernacle, the altar images, both altar images, have to do with fragrance. There's powdered incense that's sprinkled upon the golden altar in the most holy place, and in the courtyard, what you have is lamb or beef roasting or bread that's baking on the, uh, on, on, on the altar. And so you have, you have these odors, these appetizing odors, these sweet odors that are associated with repentance and consecration and dedication and fellowship with God and with worship and with, and with, and with prayer. So, what a novel idea. Prayer as an odor weapon. Uh, it's an unusual idea, I know. I just thought we, we just need to have a little fun here and talk about, uh, and talk about uh, this. One of the challenges is, on a practical basis, the uh, human diminished capacity for smell. And I would suggest it's parallel to human uh, discernment that seems to be totally disabled, even among Christians, to be able to distinguish between spiritual... Uh, uh, evil and good in the atmosphere and understand the spiritual uh, a a atmosphere. There is a biblical, a kind of biblical connection, a metaphor, if you will, an analogy, if you will. I I'm not pressing the metaphor in a literal way, but I'm trying to extract from the metaphor something that, uh, that might have uh, a way of helping us understand this. I know, I don't believe at least, not yet, that you can smell prayer. Uh, the bigger idea is that fragrances change the atmosphere, making an atmosphere pleasant or unpleasant. And in the same way, by analogy, does prayer change 
the atmosphere? Does it create an inviting atmosphere in which God is drawn into the fragrance of prayer? Again, an analogy. Or does the absence of prayer allow uh, noxious odors and spirits and an atmosphere that's toxic, that, uh, that where God does not work in the maximum way that he might want to uh, uh, work? Could a healthy prayer life, uh, could healthy prayer itself transform Form the atmosphere of a home or a church or, wow, a city or yet a nation. Humble, repentant, broken, tearful prayer. So what if prayer had some kind of negative, overwhelming, disabling effect on the evil one and his hordes? And what if incense over a city sent the evil one pinching his nose and, uh, and, 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 and fleeing? Throughout the Bible, you find references to aroma. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, Genesis 8 and 21. And in that case, it elicited grace. And he said, I will never again, this, this never again pledge from God regarding judgment came because God smelled, God smelled a soothing aroma. Wow. Uh, Paul calls us to be a fragrant aroma. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. And he's talking about the effect of prayer on our lives. Some evidence to others to which we may not be aware in the natural, in, 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 the, in, the, in the olfactory, olfactory capacity of our, uh, of, our, of our being. But Paul links prayer and our lives and our witness to this aroma, to this fragrance, and to the knowledge of Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through uh, uh, 16. So in the tabernacle again, and in the temple, there's great imagery about the altar of incense, fragrance, burned twice daily, framing the day with prayer, smelling up the holy place. Uh, if you'd been anywhere uh, or camped around the tabernacle, you've been drawn to the tabernacle by the fragrance of the meat cooking on the, uh, on the, burnt, uh, on, on the burnt offering. We'll talk about this just uh, a little bit uh, more. Uh, there was a project, I don't know if it's going on now, called the Non-Lethal Weapons De Development. It was an attempt to develop a next-generation stink bomb that could be deployed to encourage large numbers of people to voluntarily leave a building or even a city or a section of the city. It was... It was uh, the Monel Chemical Census Center was involved in this in Philadelphia, and it was all happening under the name of National Security. Department of Defense uh, funded this. CIA, FBI were involved in this. The Army, local law enforcement all saw the potential of an odor weapon for use with crowd control and even in, even in warfare. They called it odor deterrence. People don't hang out around dumpsters, they asserted. And you know, animals uh, mark their territory uh, to intruders, and there are similar technologies that are being developed all over the, 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 the world. In fact, let's just take a look at, uh, at this uh, together, if you will. Again, non-weapons de development, an attempt to create this stink bomb that when deployed would encourage you and me to leave the building, leave the area, uh, and so forth. And the problem is our lack of developed, uh, a developed sense of, of, uh, of smell. The human, the human nose, the olfactory system, detects changes to smell uh, more than it does smell it, it itself. Uh, I, I'm so sorry. This is washed out on the screen. Is that the way it's going to show up in the video?
No, you don't want it like that. Got to fix it. And that's a. We can't do it like that. I mean, it, it, it makes no sense if it's like that. It, you can't breed it. Jack, yeah. you've got to have a list. No, I had it fixed. No, no, no. You've got to have a list to go through, and you've got to have a list. I had it good when you first came in here. Everything was 100% straight. Then Andy came and said, oh, you have it on the prefix? I said, I don't. It's a prefix. I didn't want to put it. And you didn't say anything. You just dropped it. No, not a bit. You can't read it. It's washed out. You can't read it. No, you can read that. I can't read it. I can't read I can read that. Now, why, why does it look like that? Because you're far away from the screen. If they're, through, if they're on their laptops or their, or their phones, they'll be able to read it. Can't do it any better. You got, that's a little better than it was, but you can't do it any better, huh? I might be able to adjust the background. Uh, no, it's graphics. I'm going to do 100%. I don't want you. I don't think you want to take your color down. You see, you're losing it if you take your color down because then you lose that background, which is a part of the problem. And it's washed out completely. See, that's why you need, I know, I'm, I know I'm being mean to you, but that's why you need a list with all this stuff written down. a little better um, okay where can we pick up I don't want to go back and do this whole thing where can we pick up uh, why don't we go back to this right here so I talked about non-lethal weapons you're still recording right yeah. so I talked about non-lethal weapons and then I came to the slide so why don't why don't we uh, um,
back to here because he was because we were talking to his dad about the human olfactory system and we go back and tie us right here. So technically you could just leave the old back that piece to the The human olfactory system? Right here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. This is an edit point. Okay. The human olfactory system detects changes in odors more than it monitors odors. It, it takes about 15 minutes to adjust to a new order and reasonably acclimatized. For example, they say that, the, the, that, that our senses stir at the smell of uh, frying bacon. But if the bacon is out all day long, we adjust. We adjust to that uh, uh, smell, even to a somewhat disgusting uh, or unpleasant odor. So you learn to live around the paper factory or, 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 uh, or, or, or whatever. But there's, a, but there's another problem as well. Uh, bad Odor to us is not universally bad odor uh, somewhere else. Odor preferences shift from culture to uh, uh, from culture to culture. Hearing degenerates over time, but our odor detection that capability is underdeveloped. For example, we use only forty percent of it. Here's an interesting idea. A dog's sense of smell is 10,000 to 100,000 times more sensitive th than, than humans. Let's take the lower threshold. Suppose that a dog is only 10,000 times more sensitive to smell or odor than you, and, uh, than you and I are. That means, if we use sight as an analogy, what a human could see a third of a mile away, a dog could see 3,000 miles away. Uh, they detect odors in parts per trillion. And we know, of course, that insects and animals and even plants use odors to uh, attract and to, and to fight. Mosquitoes uh, find us through uh, smell. Plants emit smells to attract uh, pollinators like bees and, and butterflies. Carnivorous plants use floral-like scents to lure their prey. Everybody knows about, about uh, skunks. And some animals have scent packages that if they're injured or if they are uh, ruptured or if they're under attack, they send a scent signal, a distress call, to their social kin group to come and help them. Navig uh, navigation of, of animals is by, is by sense of smell. All of us know about bloodhounds and, uh, and uh, spawning areas by uh, a smell. Friends and foes are known by their sense of smell. The perfume industry knows this well. It's a $25 billion industry. Here's, here's an interesting idea. They are working now on television sets that emit odors. So what you're watching will give you a sense of smelling what you're watching. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that's a great idea at all. I'm not so sure I want one of those television, those television uh, uh, sets. 2000, 2000 BC, Indians in the Far East were already using toxic fumes on the battlefield. And uh, Chinese writings tell us about hundreds of recipes for poisonous, irritating smokes as battlefield uh, tactics. All the way back to the 7th century BC, you get what is called a soul hunting fog. Gas bombs were common around AD 1000. And during the Civil War, the North was experimenting with shells that would explode over Confederate lines and uh, create uh, a chlorine cloud that would cause the uh, Southern Army to, uh, to, to, to run. Enough. Enough. Let's talk about prayer. Prayer is understood in, understood in Scripture as odor, as a cloud of pungent smoke.
incense. And like many odors, we, we, don't, we don't have the developed capacity to smell prayer, nor can we see prayer, nor should we pray for some kind of gift to smell uh, prayer or to smell God. Again, we're, we're talking about an analogy, an analogy here. Heaven, however, views our prayers, our worship as fragrant, smoky incense and as transformative to the atmosphere, whether we can smell it or not. Both tabernacles, again, in the, both altars rather, in the tabernacle and in the temp temple, the brass altar with an open flame and the golden altar with its hot coals were smoky and, and they were aromatic. Again, just talking about this metaphor of incense, the brass altar stood in the courtyard of the tabernacle. Here, here, here it is. And it had a myriad of odors attached to it. The smell of crackling fire, the fragrance of roasting beef and lamb, grain offerings or, or meal, bread, the smell of fresh bread. These were sweet-smelling savors unto the Lord. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9. And there was also the smell of death. There was also the smell of blood. And the twice daily burnt offering given on this altar. The golden altar was also burned twice daily. It stood in the holy place, at the crown of the, of the holy place, right here, right in front of the veil. Here is the Ark of the Covenant. Here is the altar of incense. You see it here from another perspective. It has a crown, it has four horns, and then there's a place where hot coals, actually small stones, were taken from this altar, white hot, placed here, and then incense from the table, the table you can't see it, it's covered up, was put in powdered form over these rocks twice daily in the morning and then again in the evening. Again, on these coals, here, here, incense, powdered incense, uh, was sprinkled, and when it touched the fire, the temperature change released an odor, the sweet odor of incense, not detected until it touched the fire and uh, the powder melted. So in our lives, when prayer is fervent, when it's mixed with the fire that calls for the death of sin and self, here, for fellowship with God, here, the peace offering, that kind of prayer becomes sweet and effective before God. That fragrant smoke, the sweet smell of communion with God, was to characterize, it was to characterize the holy place. Uh, well, we're having a little fun talking about this wonderful analogy, this interesting analogy, the power of incense. So let's press the metaphor. What if, again, prayer released some kind of atmospheric change, whether we could, could detect it or not, a kind of aroma attractive to God and to His presence, an aroma of spirit healthy spiritual life of holiness, of purity, of wholesomeness, of godliness. And what if, what if that same fragrance was repelling to the demonic? And what if, as in warfare technology, an incense bomb disabled the enemy, not killing him, but sending him fleeing? What if he flees from uh, prayer when we resist him and submit ourselves to God. What if, again, pushing the metaphor, demons had the capacity to, I know, I know it's a crazy idea, and I'm not suggesting it in a literal sense, but in a figurative sense. What if they had the capacity to smell prayer, and what if they hated it, and worse yet, what if they were allergic to it? What if they were sickened by it? What if they were disabled by it? I'm just using this not as a wild, crazy doctrine, but as a, but as a, but as an illustration as a metaphor. What if by the sheer volume of intercession, we lifting holy hands everywhere sent forth a bouquet to God that was at the same time a warning, a repellent to the evil one? Could prayer as incense transform the atmosphere of our towns, of our cities, 
and, and, its, and its inviting and repelling aspects that escape our sensibilities, a, a, a potency far beyond our imagination. Should we be more motivated to cloud the atmosphere daily with incense, to smell up the complexes in which we work and, and, and where we uh, uh, live, uh, to, to odorize, as it were, our neighborhood. Should we be more motivated to cloud such atmospheres with God's presence? What effect could prayer have on our community? What impact could two or three Christians have gathered in His name praying at their, praying at their workplace? I'm just drawing an analogy. Maybe it helps us think about prayer in a little a different way. The Bible says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. That is really quite incredible. Despite God's recognition that man's heart was forever evil, Noah's sacrifice effected a halt to Judgment. Now here's scripture. Uh, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. This is powerful smoke. Paul the Apostle urges the Ephesians, you should walk in love just as Christ loved us and, and, and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a, there it is, as a fragrant, as a fragrant aroma. Ezekiel ties the manifestation to the person, not merely to the sacrifice. L listen to this. As a soothing aroma, I will accept you. When I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from where you're scattered, and I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nation. So after Judah had sinned and they had been taken captive into Babylon, God envisioned them returning as a, as a fragrant people, a soothing aroma before him and the nation. So the sweetness and analogy is to be about my life and to be about your life. In fact, Hosea pictured Israel as a flower. As the blossom and fragrance of a tender lily, the smell of a cedar, the fragrance of an oil producing. And of course, this is an allusion to the anointing, to the olive tree producing a fragrant kind of smell. Talking about the power of incense. And Paul, this is New Testament, presses the analogy in his second letter to the Corinthians. He says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph and manifests through us, ah, the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. What an idea. We triumphed in Christ. And that victory, that victory life, the victory life we live is noticeable as a fragrance. I'm not pressing the literal meaning. I'm pushing this analogy. Maybe it gives us an ability to see this in a little, in a little different, uh, in a little different uh, way. We are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. Who is adequate for these things? Indeed, this is beyond us, beyond our capacity to uh, to, to to grasp this and and to. Uh, I understand. The Philippians, Paul says, Paul says, their gifts, not some gift on a ceremonial altar. No, no, no. But their very tangible offering to assist his work was a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice. Going back to the Old Testament altars, a pleasing aroma to God, well-pleasing rather to, to God. So giving has a fragrance just as prayer has a fragrance. Here, as in the Old Testament, as in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, giving and prayer are conjoined as acts of love and 
uh, love and, and incense to God. Prayer. So prayer and giving always bound together. Praying, giving, people, smell, sweet. Giving without prayer is not whole. Since the gift is a symbol of the giver and, and, and the gift of self. And, and prayer without giving is like an empty altar, one without a sacrifice. In fasting, prayer finds restraint. It finds discipline. Remember the three great disciplines of Jesus, prayer, fasting, and giving, Matthew chapter 6. In, in fasting, prayer finds restraint. It finds discipline. But in giving, prayer finds expression. And the two, actually the three, are bound together. In the moments in which incense was burned at the tabernacle, fire was taken from the brass altar here. And it was taken from the courtyard into the holy place here. Passing the laver, moving between the table and the lampstand, you would come to the altar of incense. And the coals were placed here in vases on the altar of incense. They actually weren't coals. They were hot stones, heated, white, hot. Incense in powdered form was stored on the, on the table. And you would take this, a spoonful, and sprinkle it over these hot coals or rocks. And when the heat of the rocks touched the powder, it melted and gave forth this pungent, this pungent uh, 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 odor. And the smoke of the incense would rise and fill the, the holy place. This is, by the way, the same time that the lamps were trimmed and, the, and filled with oil, the wicks were trimmed, and they were again, and they were again set afire. So all three, the, you go to the, to the table, which represents the Word of God, and get incense for the altar. And at the same time, oil, which was stored here, is poured into the lampstand. And you're again filled with oil, an analogy of the Holy Spirit, and the lighting of my fire, my wit the witness of my life. So prayer and the bread or the word and the oil and the lampstand, fruit and fire, all of these are bound together in one glorious kind of, uh, uh, of image. In this moment, every piece of furniture in the tabernacle came together. Every piece. Because you're taking fire off this altar, you're passing the laver, you're, you're putting the hot coals here on the altar, you're taking incense from this altar and sprinkling it over the hot coals, you're borrowing oil here, and you're filling the uh, candlestick and trimming the wicks. Every one of these is brought together, activated at the same time. You would have not passed the labor. You would have made sure your hands were clean because you're going to go into the holy place and you're going to handle holy things. And then beyond this is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's glory, the very seat or throne room of, uh, of, of God. And here at this altar, the priest would pray facing the Ark of the Covenant, facing the veil and what was beyond the, uh, the, the veil. Looking, of course, he couldn't, couldn't see it at the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and, and the cherubim. This would all be under the canopy. You can't see this. This is a, a ram skin, or badger skin, rather, but underneath here is a, a tin curtain arrangement that's in the color of uh, blue, purple, scarlet, and linen. Literally, that's the Miss Cain. Literally, that is the tabernacle. Everything else is structure. Everything else is furniture. Uh, that is that is the uh, the tabernacle, a and uh, and that's under the covering of ram skin dyed red, and uh, and uh, that represents the uh, that represents the blood. So the ingredients of incense. What what are they? Because they give us clues too. Stack from the myrrh tree. When the bark was cut, the sap would flow out spontaneously, generously. And then it was converted into a powder and crushed fine. Second ingredient, anica or anacha, a, a sweet-smelling shell shellfish from the depths of the Red Sea, also converted to powder. The smell was detected only when burned. Three, galbanum, from a shrub in the high country of Syria. 
you would break the limbs of the trig, twigs of the shrub and you would make an incision on the tree and the juice or sap would ooze out and, uh, and then be scraped off, dry and be scraped off and, and it too was made into a, uh, a powder. And then frankincense, a white gum drawn from the incision of a tree, pure, sweet, Arama Aramaic, the resin dried on the tree and again it was scraped off. All of these were together uh, the ingredients for the incense that was burned on the altar twice daily. So let's talk about this. So the ingredients of incense included again stack from the myrrh tree. When its bark was cut it flowed out spontaneously. Ah goodness gracious. Okay you'll have to edit this make a point okay. So let's look at this, let's look at this again. Worship, like incense, is a combination of that which flows out spontaneously, stacked. That that comes from the depths of our being, Annika. That which is humble and broken, Galbanum. That which is pure and sweet, frankincense scent. And 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 that and that too is 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 catalytic. This is a this is a picture of of worship. The sacrificial life gives off a fragrance that's pleasing to God. And catalytic and catalytic things catalytic things happen. Uh, here is a picture of the priest burning incense at the. Uh, golden altar. Here are the cherubim, here is the veil, the paraket. Beyond this would have been the beyond this would have been the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place. So the golden altar is a priestly place. It's a place of intercession. And Zacharias, remember, the father of John the Baptist, burned incense at the time of prayer in the temple. This is a picture of the tabernacle, but the analogy is is very much the same. And, uh, and the people were outside, the people were outside praying. And here's what the Bible indicates that happened when he burned this, this incense. And by implication, what happens when we go to the altar and offer this spontaneous, deep, broken, pure prayer to God? Well, this is when God broke his silence. That's what we want to happen. And this is when angels were released. And you'll notice the cherubim here. And, and again, you can't see the, you can't see the Miss Cain or the tabernacle, but if you looked up in the tabernacle ceiling, it would be embroidered with the faces of cherubim, uh, a special high order of, uh, of angels. Here's the next thing that happened. The barrenness of his wife Elizabeth is, is broken. Here's what happened. A prophetic voice was being re uh, prepared. In the child that would be born, John the Baptist. Joy and gladness are promised. Many, we're told, will turn to the Lord. Families will be healed. The hearts of the fathers will be turned back to the children. A people will be prepared for a visitation from God. Powerful things happen when we go to the altar and burn Incense. We're talking about the power of incense. The 24 elders in heaven, the Bible said, sit on thrones around the throne of God and hold incense in their vials, a symbol of the prayers of the earthly saints, the prayers of thousands of generations. And, and, and these are prayers that God has heard to which he has said, yes, but not yet. These yes, but not yet prayers are committed to these heavenly elders to hold for their appointed time. These elders, robed in white, are a symbol of righteousness, and they sit upon thrones and wear crowns, and that reveals their kingly, royal, priestly status. And that kingly status is what God affords to prayer. What an extraordinary idea is all these notions bound up, bound up 
uh, together. We're talking about the power of incense. Prayers then have a governing power about them. They tap the omnipotence of God, and He moves in this cloud of incense. And at some point then, these yes but not yet answered prayers will become now moments. They will be mixed with fire from heaven's altar, as in Revelation, as in Revelation 8. And, and incense, the prayers of the saints, and divine uh, fire, the power of the heavenly altar, and the power of prayer will be released into the earth. John describes the scene in heaven. Seven angels stand before the throne with trumpets ready to sound. And all of this is tied to my prayer and your prayer now held by 24 elders, taken, collected from them, and placed upon the altar. And God is saying, all right, I said yes to those prayers and not yet. But now I'm saying yes to those prayers and now is the time. And the power and energy and the force of God's will will be done, will be done in the earth. We're talking about, we're talking about the power of incense. An angel, the Bible says in Revelation 8, where the golden censer stands at the golden altar in heaven, the real altar. See, this is the altar that corresponds to the shadow. And the shadow is the altar before which Zechariah stood in the narrative of Luke. See, when we pray, heaven's altar, the real altar, smokes. Our altars are only shadows of the real altar, the one to which we aspire. And the Bible said the angel was given much incense, the substance of the prayers of all God's people, and they were offered on the golden altar in front of the throne of God. And the smoke of the incense, the prayers of the saints, are then mingled with fire from the altar and hurled into the earth. And suddenly, suddenly on the earth, there's a storm. There's thunder and there's rumblings and there's lightning and there's an earthquake. And the planet, the planet trembles. Oh, 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 the power of God associated with, that comes through, that's released through in association with this thing called, with this thing called prayer. Oh, hallelujah. Well, we had a little fun tonight. And, uh, and we drew an analogy, and of course, that's the whole point of the odor, uh, uh, lecture, it's, it, it is an analogy, but it's an interesting analogy, isn't it? Pray with me. Father, would you let there be a sweetness about my life? Father, would you let me believe and enact a transformation of the atmosphere by prayer? Have you ever noticed when sincere prayer takes place how it changes the atmosphere? I've seen people run. I've seen people get mad. I've seen people walk away when somebody started praying. I've seen people who are hardened bow their head and the tears begin to come. Prayer does change the atmosphere. We not, might not be able to smell it. And I'm not sure the evil one can, but I believe prayer changes the atmosphere. And that's the whole point, is that we want to transform the atmosphere, the atmosphere through prayer that there will be a sweetness that would rise from our life. Our hearts are really, our hearts are really uh, altars from which worship rises. Well, I'm going to let you out a little early tonight. God bless you. We've got one more session, one more session to go, and we had a lot to cover in that last session because we're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see how the prayer closet has its roots in the Garden of Eden. God bless you.